Let's learn about the bilinear transform, the basis of a popular technique to map a continuous time filter to a discrete time filter free of aliasing. To get started, let's take a look at some of the highlights of the bilinear transform. This transform maps the entire left half plane of the S plane into the interior of the unit circle of the Z plane. Why is this significant? Well, the left half plane and the interior of the unit circle is where we place the poles when we want a stable filter. Now, a big advantage of the bilinear transform is that it eliminates the aliasing problems that are associated with the impulse invariance method. Impulse invariance samples the continuous time impulse function. However, the bilinear transform maps the entire left half plane into the unit circle. Therefore, there's no, there's no aliasing due to sampling. The bilinear transform is the primary method to transform a continuous time filter into its discrete time filter counterpart. The advantage for using a continuous time filter prototype is that we can leverage the extensive knowledge base that we have on continuous time filters. It's important to recognize that we do need to pre-warp, as it's called, the discrete time filter critical frequencies to their corresponding continuous time fre filter frequencies before we design the continuous time filter. Okay, let's start taking a look at some of the details here. The bilinear transform mapping equations look like this. As we go from continuous time to discrete time, we write z equals 1 plus t sub d divided by 2 times s, that would be our s plane variable, divided by essentially the same form except we use 1 minus t sub d divided by 2 times s. Going in the other direction, we have the discrete time to continuous time version of the equation. This looks like s equals 2 divided by t sub d times 1 minus z inverse divided by 1 plus z inverse. Let's take a look at this t sub d parameter. This is a parameter associated with the step size when we're using numerical integration. And this is when we want to transform differential equations that are continuous time into difference equations that are discrete time. This turns out to be an arbitrary constant when we use the bilinear transform for filter design. For that reason, I will just choose t sub d equals 2 for simplicity's sake. That is, substituting 2 in here changes that to a 1. And in like fashion, it changes this to a 1 as well. Therefore, we can go with these simpler versions of the bilinear transform mapping equations. Let's take a look at the relationship between the s plane with its sigma and j omega axis and the z plane with its real and imaginary axis. I've also drawn the unit circle in the z plane. Let's take a look at some specific points. DC operation of our filter would place us right at the origin. S is sigma plus j omega, and with the origin choice, both sigma and omega are zero. Substituting those values in our continuous time to discrete time version, we have one plus S, which is sigma plus j omega, divided by 1 minus s, which means we have 1 minus sigma minus j omega. For this specific choice, sigma and j omega are both 0. That leaves us with the value z equals 1. That means dc maps to this location in the z-plane. Let's try a little bit higher frequency. Try the unit frequency j equals or uh, omega equals one, so that's the j one point. 
I'm still on the j omega axis. That means sigma is zero. So let me copy that and then make that substitution. We have zero plus j. We divide by one minus zero minus j. Doing a rectangular to polar conversion, we have square root of two times e to the j pi over four radians divided by this gives us the same magnitude of square root of two, but now the angle is pointing towards the southeast. Subtracting the denominator phase, we have e to the j pi over two with a radius of one. And that brings us along right here. This frequency omega, and this would be little omega as it's called in the discrete time, or Z plane, says that little omega is pi over two for capital omega equals one. Now, as we continue to travel along the J omega axis towards increasingly high frequency, ultimately getting us to J inf uh, infinite value, let's see what happens when you do that. Omega is clear, or uh, infinite value is clearly a lot larger than one. The J is cancel. Infinity divided by infinity is one, and we're left with the sine. Evidently, we end up on this spot over here. So as we travel up the J omega axis, we eventually get to this frequency pi when capital omega is infinite. Let's take a look at some other values of capital omega as well. I'm visualizing the S plane as it's converted into the Z plane. And here's our J omega axis right there. If you look carefully at the white line, you can see it traveling up and down the J omega axis. And we see our, our DC point here. The highest frequency limit ends up right there, presently at one. And as I continue to increase that upper frequency limit, we see it wrapping around and heading towards negative one. Now you'll notice this is the extent when we sweep from zero to one and on up through 10. Note that we pretty rapidly get around the circle just between zero and one, but we seem to be taking some time to actually get to negative one. We get a lot closer if I change the upper limit to 100, but uh, we have to get to inf infinite value before it actually hits negative one. So our main conclusion is that the J omega axis maps directly onto the unit circle. Well, let's try some variations of sigma. I'll stay on the sigma axis here. Let's try plugging in sigma is minus one and capital omega is zero. Evidently this spot translates to the origin of the Z plane. As we continue to travel towards uh, increasingly negative values for sigma, which corresponds to higher damping areas, if we're considering the impulse response of the system, eventually we get to this limiting form. Minus infinity divided by positive infinity, that's negative one. And negative one is located right here, which we've already established was where we end up when capital omega is an infinitely high value. Let's explore this behavior along the sigma axis. So again, watch the leading edge here. As I traverse back and forth in more or less a, a uniform fashion, we see that on the Z transform plane or Z plane, a relatively small change here in the S plane means a pretty large change here in the Z plane. In fact, here I'm at one, and then here I am at the origin, already halfway across the unit circle. Now, as I continue to sweep in the negative direction, we see that the rate of progress in the Z plane slows down considerably. And in fact, even when I push this up to a relatively large value of minus 100, still haven't quite got to negative one. That's where we see, again, that's a limiting process. We have to get to minus infinity before we actually hit negative one.
So in terms of switching back to J omega axis variation here a little bit and trying to combine that with some variations along the sigma, uh, sigma value, note that with this vertical line, I'm effectively taking the J omega axis and sliding it back and forth for different values of sigma. And note how we get circles and their, their uh, radius varies according to the position along the sigma axis. Here we can get a whole family of vertical lines and see how they map. We find that each subset of our left half plane ends up looking like a smaller circle. Now let's try holding capital omega constant. So this is interesting. We see that straight lines get bent into arcs. In this case, the arc gets smaller as we move up in the frequency axis direction. Again, we can get a whole family of contours set up like this. Here we see that particular contour. Here's the next one, and so forth. This one right here maps to that small arc like that. We find in this case that each frequency translates into a single arc in the z-plane. Now we can get both of those going at the same time. I can get contours going both vertically and horizontally. I can also control the density of my straight line contours in the s-plane. So I have higher density going this way. Let's get higher density going vertically too. So we see that a uniform pattern in the S-plane, uniform arrangement of contours, translates into circular arcs in the Z-plane. We see that the high frequency areas all map into the left half side of the Z-plane as well. Let's try a couple other quick experiments. Here I'm looking at a fairly limited range of frequencies, but a wide range of sigma values. We see how that maps into the z-plane. If I confine our area of study to simply between 0 and 1, or actually negative 1 to, to 1, we see that fills up about half of the z-plane. So we say as capital omega ranges from minus j to plus j and sigma goes from minus 1 to 0, that little square basically fills the right semicircle of the z-plane. Now let's wrap up our study here by considering one more time the behavior along the j omega axis. And this leads into the notion of pre-warping. So we're looking specifically at the mapping between the J omega axis and the unit circle. So we're looking at capital omega, which is continuous time frequency, and how that has, does have units of radians per second, and how that translates into discrete time frequency with units of radians per sample. Now, S is sigma plus J omega. Let's equate that to our bilinear transform equation. Now, we're talking mapping just along the J omega axis. That means we want to hold sigma equals zero. Now, we know this mapping is the unit circle, and this would be where Z equals E to the J omega. Go ahead and make that substitution. Now, I'm going to rewrite one in a specifically chosen way, and we'll see why that is in just a moment. If you look carefully, if I were to multiply those two terms together, I would, in fact, get 1. Now, I want to split this one in half as well. Again, you'll notice if you multiply both of these, you get back to the original forms that we had. Now, something interesting happens here. Note that we have a common term that we can pull out, fr we can pull out front. These nicely divide out. And if you study the top or the numerator, this looks like sine, and this looks like cosine. 
if you look at the forms based on Euler's identity that, that define sine and cosine, if we were to multiply and divide by two, do the same thing using J2, that way we've now converted these into the appropriate form for sine omega over two and cosine omega over two. Here the twos drop out, we're left with a J sitting there. Now just reminder that how we got here is we said that this was j omega equals this expression. You see the j's are dividing out. And you might recall that sine divided by cosine is the same thing as tangent. And all of this boils down quite nicely to say that capital omega equals tangent of little omega divided by 2. If I were to solve for little omega, that would look like two times the inverse tangent of capital omega. Let me switch these around so they match the previous order. We have the continuous time to discrete time warping equation and then the discrete time to continuous time version of the equation. Now pre-warping means in terms of filter design that given a specific critical frequency in discrete time, for example a filter's cutoff frequency, we apply this equation to pre-warp to get the equivalent continuous time frequency, capital Omega. Now you might say, well, why is it called warping? Well, this equation we're looking at is a nonlinear equation. Let's visualize that quickly. Plotting capital Omega as a function of normalized discrete time frequency, little Omega, we have this curve. Here I'm showing the extremes of normalized frequency. If you flip it around and plot little omega versus capital omega, uh, we find in both cases that we're looking at a nonlinear curve. Might also ask why is this called bilinear if it's a nonlinear warping? Well, we see that the uh, bilinear transform is based on first order terms only, and that's where it gets its name. All right, that wraps it up for the bilinear transform.